Uh, hopefully these summaries are giving you a good idea and when you read it back for yourself, you'll have a better understanding of what Hebrews is talking about. All right, Hebrews chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. As I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment, going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Hebrews 8. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example of and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for, see, saith he, that thou maketh, make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people." And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being calm and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us for of the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Alright, so let's get into Hebrews 7. So... Just a recap again quickly, chapters 1 to 6, so Jesus being better than the angels. Chapter 2 is, you know, we need to take heed to the Son. He took on the nature of man. Chapter 3 was, don't harden your heart with unbelief, you know, partake of the Son by faith. Uh, chapter 4 was, we can boldly enter into that rest through the Son by faith. That was chapter 4. Chapter 5 is, Christ is our high priest, and he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's what we see here today in Hebrews 7. Uh, and chapter 6 was that we go, we ought to go on unto perfection. The fact that we are empowered by the consolation of the assurance of our salvation, we can go on unto perfection and have patience as we go through the struggles and trials of being a believer. 
And then chapter 7, now chapter 7 we get on to, because we already established in chapter 5 that Jesus Christ was a priest. He's our high priest and he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now as we get into chapter 7, chapter 7 is a comparison of the priesthood of Melchizedek to the priesthood of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood. So if you're wondering what's going on here, that's why it's going now talking about Melchizedek and then it compares the two priesthoods. So chapter, verse 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So we're going to go into Genesis 14 soon and you'll see these elements here where Melchizedek is king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, that there was a slaughter of the kings and he blessed Abraham. To whom also gave, Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So we'll see uh, soon in Genesis 14 how Abraham actually paid tithes to Melchizedek. He gave him a tenth of the spoils of that battle. First being, by interpretation, king of righteousness. So what does that mean? It's saying that the name Melchizedek actually means king of righteousness. So first, by interpretation, king of righteousness. After that, also king of Salem. That's how he's described. And what does that mean? King of peace. So Salem is peace in Hebrew. Now you'll notice that Paul, as he writes Hebrews 7, this is really the passage that he's expounding on. So the, the, the prophecy of Jesus being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek is in Psalm 110.4. And you'll notice that he goes to this passage three times. The fact that it's an oath, the fact that he's priest and, and who Melchizedek is. So he, he, he really is focusing on this Old Testament passage. So it's interesting that this is, just one, this is mentioned just one time in the Old Testament in Psalm 110, yet it is such a central truth to who Jesus Christ is in the New Testament. Now, when you read through the Bible, a lot of people, you know, they, they decide one day, oh, you know, I'm going to read through the Bible, I'm going to start at Genesis and read through it. You read through Genesis and then you get to chapter 14, and then all of a sudden, this random character just comes out of nowhere, Melchizedek, right? Priest of the Most High God. I remember once uh, when I was at my first church, at the Bible Presbyterian Church, uh, somebody read, was reading through Genesis, and I remember them, them posting in, um, I can't remember, I think it was an email or some sort of forum we were in, and she was asking the question, or it was an email that went out, it's, have you guys read through Genesis before? And it's just this random character just comes out of nowhere in Genesis 14, this Melchizedek and Abraham pays tithes. Like, who is he? And that's why it's interesting that he just all of a sudden appears in Genesis 14. And then the, the prophecy in Psalm 110, and yet he's such a central figure in you know, Hebrews, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 7, where Jesus is described as being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we understand why his priesthood is so significant. But this is where he appears out of nowhere. And if you don't know what's going on in Genesis 14, uh, earlier on, basically, uh, Sod uh, Lot and Abraham have already split up. So they've split up and Sodom has pitched his t uh, Lot has pitched his tent in Sodom, so he's gone to live in Sodom. Anyways, there, there, there are kings that go and invade uh, Sodom and, and the cities about them. And basically, Lot is kidnapped. As, as well as other people in, in those cities as well. So Abraham hears about it, so he goes to rescue his nephew, right? So his trained servants in his house goes, and this is what is referred to as the slaughter of the kings, because when they went and defeated those kings and got back the people, that's where uh, Abraham went to rescue Lot. So after this battle where Abraham goes in to rescue Lot and there's this slaughter of the kings, this is where you see Melchizedek appear. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedoleoma. So these were the kings they were fighting with. And of the kings that were with him at the Valley of Shaver, which is the king's dale. And, and here where Melchizedek comes out of nowhere. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. So this is the way we learn in Hebrews that Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And he's described as the king of Salem. Brought forth bread and wine. Now I don't know if there's any significance there, but it's interesting that he brought forth bread and wine, and this is an ordinance that we do in the New Testament, right? The bread and the wine are representing the broken body and shed blood. And he was a priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him. So you see all those elements in Genesis 14? So you can see that in Hebrews 7, Paul is referring back to Genesis, 7, uh, Genesis 14. And he blessed him. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God possessor of heaven and earth. 
And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And that's all you hear about Melchizedek. So he, he comes, he's introduced as the priest of the Most High God, he blesses Abraham after the slaughter of the kings, and then Abraham basically gives him a tenth of all. Now, some people use this passage to prove that, you know, tithes is something for the New Testament. And I don't believe so, because Abraham did things, a lot of things that we don't do today, like he sacrificed animals as well. So I think if you're going to use Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek to say that tithes is a New Testament commandment, um, you have to be consistent and believe that, you know, we ought to sacrifice animals as well, because Abraham sacrificed animals. So just because people did things, that doesn't mean it's a commandment, because where would they get the commandment from that to say that you must tithe, otherwise you're cursed? Well, they would get that from the Levitical laws. They'd get that from the Mosaic laws. And obviously those are the laws that were given to the priests that were done away. So just because Abraham did something, just because he gave tithe to Melchizedek, that doesn't mean necessarily tithe is a commandment in the New Testament. That just means that that's something that he did, just like he sacrificed animals. The commandment came where we read later in Hebrews 7 that they were given a commandment to take tithes of the people. So that was the commandment given to the Levitical priesthood. Now in the New Testament, we just have free will offerings, right? We just have free will giving. So it's giving to the necessity of the saints and the necessity to keep this ministry going. And yeah, you can take the principle of tithes and say, well, if you're wondering, hey, what's a good amount that I should give to the house of God, I should give to God's work? Yeah, people can say, um, you know, tenth is a good principle to follow. So I'm not against people giving a tenth of their increase to the work of God. What I'm against is when people say it's commanded, because I just think that's not consistent in terms of, I think it has to do with the Levitical priesthood. So I'm obviously not against people tithing. I'm against people believing that it's a commandment to tithe, to give a 10%. And, and also I'm against people that teach that you are cursed if you don't tithe, because that to me is a misapplication of the Old Testament. Um, blessing and cursing into the New Testament practices that we have. So, so let's go on how he's compared. And now we learn a bit about a bit more about Melchizedek because in Genesis 14 we don't know much about Melchizedek, but Paul gives us more revelation into who Melchizedek was because really all we know about Melchizedek is that Jesus Christ or the Savior that was coming, the the, the Messiah that was coming, was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We 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 are introduced to him in Genesis 14. But now we're actually told that Melchizedek was actually a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was actually God, um, even though he's the priest of the Most High God. So we see there that, you know, I believe the Trinity there, because I believe that uh, Melchizedek is actually the person of the Word appearing uh, in a bodily form, even though uh, they hadn't, he hadn't yet made, was made flesh. That's why he was like unto the Son of God. So he's described as without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abide of the priests continually. Now, I remember, it was interesting because the first church I came from, I remember discussing this passage or discussing Melchizedek with um, my old bishop back at Lighthouse Baptist Church. And I don't know if this is the reason, because I remember back then I was saying, you know, I think that Melchizedek is, is Jesus Christ, that he's the son, he was the son of God. You know, back when I just thought, hey, you know, that made sense, that he's the son of God. I, I think a bit differently on that now. And I remember, I remember uh, Mark Tussle saying to me, saying, well, a lot of people don't believe Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. You know, they, they don't believe that he was the son of God, that he was just a, a man that, you know, was a picture of Jesus Christ, just like, you know, Joseph was a picture of Jesus Christ. You know, many people, like Solomon is a picture of Jesus Christ, you know, being the son of David, bringing peace. That, that this priest was a picture of Jesus Christ, but wasn't actually, but Melchizedek wasn't actually God. You know, he wasn't actually, now I don't believe that. I believe Melchizedek was God. I believe he was the word in bodily form and he appeared like the pre, all the pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ was the word um, in bodily form. But I wonder if it's because if you, if, you, if you try and hold to the view that Melchizedek was the son of God in that time, before the incarnation, then you have a problem because he's described as being without father, without descent. Now, obviously, people that hold to the eternal sonship view, they believe that the son of God eternally had a father, eternally always descended, eternally begotten of God. So that's where they... I wonder, I, now, I see with this whole eternal sonship and incarnational sonship argument... That's why I wonder now, is that why people back then 
want to argue that Melchizedek is not the son of God. And the argument went sort of like this, that he was like unto the son of God. So I would accept that in the sense that he's like unto the son of God because I believe the son is the one incarnated. But they would say that he was just a person and then they would explain that when it says without father, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, they would describe that as, well, he was just, we just didn't know whether he came, where he came from. We didn't know who his parents was. So it's hard for me to accept that explanation that, that Melchizedek was not actually God, but I think that's why they have a problem because they don't want to accept incarnational sonship with the Trinity view. So, but if you hold to the eternal sonship view, then you have somebody who's God, obviously without father, without beginning of days, nor end of life. You know, this cannot just be a man. Um, yeah, he's without father. So then I think that's, that's maybe why they have a problem with interpreting that way. So I personally believe that Melchizedek is the word, you know, back then, the person of the word. That's why he, here he's the priest of the Most High God, so in the fact that he's separate. But we know that the word was God. But he's made like unto the Son of God because the word prior to the incarnation was not a son. It was when the word was made flesh, um, became a son. So that's why he's like unto the Son of God because the Son of God, which is what Hebrews 7 is about, comes later, right? And he's a priest, he's another priest after the order of Melchizedek, um, even though he's, a, he's one and the same. So this is the, the mystery there, that the God was manifest in the flesh, that Melchizedek was God, and yet he was the original priest, and the Son of God is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, um, so he's like the originating priest, as well as a priest that descends, um, and another priest afterwards. All right, let's continue. Verse 4, so now he's saying here, now consider how great this man was. So now he's just pointing us out. Again, this whole chapter is about Melchizedek, but he's saying, hey, consider now who Melchizedek was and how he compares to Aaron and the fact that Jesus Christ is a priest after his order. Why? Why is he so great? Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of, of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So what is he saying here? He's saying, Melchizedek, consider how great he was. Why? Because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And then he's saying here in verse 7 that it's always the greater that is blessed, that is ble blesses the lesser, right? And he says that's why without all contradiction, the less being Abraham is blessed of the better, Melchizedek. So what he's saying here is he's better because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. But when it comes to the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood, they receive tithes of the people, and yet Levi descends from Abraham. This is what he goes on to teach. Let's go in verse 8. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. The fact that Melchizedek, it's, he's saying it's witnessed that Melchizedek has neither beginning of days nor end of life. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So remember, Hebrews 7 is a comparison of the Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood. And he's saying here how much better not only was Melchizedek to Aaron, but how much better his priesthood was to Aaron. And why he's making the case here that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Levi received tithes of the people, yet Levi was paid tithes in Abraham in the sense that Levi descended from Abraham. And so the Levitical priesthood, in a sense, those that were part of the Levitical priesthood actually paid tithes to Melchizedek. So you see what he's saying there? He's saying that that's why Melchizedek is so much better than Aaron as a priest or Aaron's priesthood because Melchizedek, in a sense, receives tithes from Levi as a whole because Levi was in Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to him. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. So what does that mean? 
So that tells us that perfection does not come from the Levitical priesthood, and this is the case that he's making to the Hebrews as he writes this epistle. For under it, the people received the law. So remember how even in the first couple of chapters where he's trying to exhort them to not go back under the law, to, to be saved by grace, to, to, have, to have salvation, enter into the rest by belief. Again, he's saying here, you don't get perfect by the Levitical priesthood. For under it, the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should, arise, should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called uh, after the order of Aaron? So what he's saying here is, if you could be perfected by the Levitical priesthood, but you can't, right? But the, the, what he's stating here is, if you could be perfect by the Levitical priesthood, why then in Psalms 110 would another priest arise after the order of Melchizedek? Why would Melchizedek's priesthood continue and would, would we require another priest after his order if the priesthood of Aaron already made us perfect, already was enough for us to be able to enter into the holiest of all? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So what is he saying here? This is why when he goes into Hebrews 8, it's the New Testament replacing the Old Testament. So he's saying just like the priesthood is being changed from the priesthood of Aaron to the priesthood of Melchizedek, the laws in order to get into the holiest of all are going to be changed as well. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So what is he talking about here? Psalm 110, you know, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, he, Jesus Christ, of whom these things are spoken, pertaineth to another tribe. So you see how we're not no longer under this Levitical priesthood. A priest is coming after the order of Melchizedek, and he's saying, hey, the person who this who this is being spoken of, that he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, is not of the Levite tribe, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So you see how he's drawing there the distinction between the two priesthoods, because he's saying they are of the tribe of Levi, but Jesus, who's a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. So you can see here, it's a totally different priesthood that is being talked about here jesus christ came of the tribe of judah and why was that because he was the son of david right he had to be a king which is why he was born of the tribe of judah hebrews 7 verse 15 and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of melchizedek there ariseth another priest so again he's saying hey you see there's this other priesthood psalm 110 tells us that somebody's going to come after the order of melchizedek who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of, the en of an endless life. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the priests of the Levitical priesthood were ordained because it was part of the Levitical laws and the Levitical commandments. But Jesus, as a priest, was not made of that law. He wasn't a priest because of the Levitical laws. He was made a priest because of an oath. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is referring to this endless life that this priest that would come after would live forever because he was going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling. So what is disannulling? This, is, this word means void, right? For there is verily, it's making void or cancelling out, right? The Old Testament. Of the commandment going before. Right, so what is that? These are the commandments of the Old Testament and the Levitical priesthood in order to be perfect. They're cancelled out. There is no perfection by the Old Testament laws and by the Levitical priesthood. For the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Why was it weak and unprofitable? For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. So again, we see the difference there. Salvation by works of the law, which was not possible. Right? Nobody was made perfect by the works of the law or by the Levitical priesthood. These two come in hand in hand. Why did the Levitical priesthood exist? Because if they broke the law, then the Levitical priesthood was there in order to, for them to be able to absolve those sins and enter into the holiest of all. But that's not possible, right? As we learn a bit later on. But the bringing in of a better hope did. 
by the which we draw nigh unto God. So see, so we have these priesthood that allow us to come close to God. And it's important that you note that because as we go into Hebrews 10 next week, this is this whole idea of drawing nigh to God or drawing back from God. So these priesthood is what allows us to do that. But we learn that the Levitical priesthood, it was, it was not possible for them to be made perfect in order to approach God. And that's why the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek, allows us to be sanctified and cleansed in order to enter into the holiest of all. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made a priest. For those priests, so talking about so in as much as not without an oath he was made a priest, this is talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek, for those priests were made without an oath. So now he's referring to the Levitical priests. For those priests were made without an oath, but this, who? Jesus, with an oath, by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what is he saying here? When somebody in the Old Testament, a Levite, after, after the order of Aaron, who was part of Aaron's family, who could be a priest, they were made priests because of the law, right? The law is what made them priests. But the law is not what made Jesus Christ a priest, right? What made Jesus Christ a priest was an oath by God. So isn't that interesting that, again, we have priests of the law, and then we have priests, which is the Old Covenant, and then we have a priest, Melchizedek, and Jesus Christ of the new covenant. The new covenant is of grace, and he's not made a priest by law. He's made a priest by an oath, a promise. Right? So again, we see there the difference in the old covenant, the new covenant, difference of works and grace, the difference of commandments and, and promise. And Jesus Christ, being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, was made a priest by an oath, by a promise. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So isn't it interesting that Paul just goes on in this whole chapter really just expounding on that psalm in Psalm 110 about Jesus. Uh, let's go on. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. So again, saying, hey, how the New Testament is so much better than the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you can't get perfect. The New Testament is what makes you perfect by grace. And they truly were many priests. So now talking about the Aaronic priests, the Levitical priests, there was, a, there was many of them, right? There was many different Levitical priests. Why? Because they died. They didn't continue to live, so they had to keep being replaced because they were not suffered to continue or continue their service and their ministry to God by reason of death. But this man, who is he talking about? Jesus. Because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So this is why Jesus Christ, he says, wherefore he is also able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So this is another reason why we are saved forever once we enter into that rest. So you see, the priesthood prepares us to enter into that rest once we enter in by faith. Not only does the blood of Jesus Christ te testify for us, but his priesthood also intercedes for us forever. So we learn many different facets of our salvation to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us so that's the fact that Jesus Christ truly was a man who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who needeth not daily as those high priests, which high priests? The high priests of the Levitical priesthood, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the, sin, then for the people's. But this he did once when he offered up himself. Now you don't want to misunderstand this because obviously the priests... The high priest in the Old Testament, before he would enter into the holiest of all, remember, he had to do a sacrifice for his own sins first. And then after he did a sacrifice for his own sins, he did a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And then he entered into the holiest of all, which with, with the blood from those sacrifices as a picture of the true tabernacle. So when it says Jesus Christ did the same, for this he did, obviously Jesus Christ didn't have to die for his own sins because we already established in Hebrews 4 that he was a priest. Um, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he didn't have to make a sacrifice for his own sins. But what he's saying here is what he did once is that he died for the sins. He offered up a sacrifice for the sins of the people, not for his own sins. When he offered up himself, 
For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. See, so the priests of the Old Testament were sin, they were sinners as well. And they were made priests according to the law. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it made him the son, because the incarnation is what made him the son. It's saying, maketh the son a priest. Right? Because it's all in reference to Psalm 110. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the priests of Aaron, this is where it really it draws the distinction, what I was teaching you before. I just find it so interesting. I don't know if you realize this, that the old covenant was a covenant of works. The new covenant is a covenant of grace, promises of God. The works, the, the works of the law is what ordained the, the Aaronic priests, right? the Levitical priests, but it was a promise that made Jesus a priest. Isn't that so interesting? That he's, a, he's, he's the priest of a covenant of grace by promises, and by a promise he was made a priest. And, but the priests in, in, in the Levitical priesthood were priests of the law, and the law made them priests. So really, the distinguishing there between the old covenant of works and the new covenant of grace. So that's chapter 7. Chapter 7, we see the comparison of the two priesthoods. And the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is obviously who Jesus is, a priesthood after the order of, is so much better, right? And, and we're considering that a Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek and Levi came of Abraham and Levi, in a sense, paid tithes to Melchizedek's priesthood. That's why that priesthood is so much better. That's chapter 7. Now, chapter 8 is a, is a, is a shorter chapter but really, what this chapter is about, you'll see, is when he says, hey, this is the sum, is now he's just stating, stating the fact that we have these two priesthood, we have the Old Testament and New Testament. Chapter 8 is the, the Old Testament is going to get replaced by the New Testament. Just like there was in verse chapter 7, there was a change of the priesthood, now there's a change of the law. He's saying, hey, now of the things which you have spoken, this is the sum. So now he goes over again. Hey, we have such an high priest, right? Jesus Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we have a new priest, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Right? So what's this true tabernacle? This true tabernacle was the one in heaven as opposed to the one on earth, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So he's now starting to set the theme of what he's going to talk about in Hebrews 9, which is actually the sacrifice of blood and how the blood of Jesus compares to the blood of the animals in the Old Testament. So we have a priest. He's a minister of the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary, which is made by God, not the one on earth. And just like there were gifts and sacrifices, in the Old Testament tabernacle on earth, he's saying, hey, in the true tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, there's also going to be a gift and sacrifice that is given, which is Jesus Christ, when he offered up himself, right? When you see here, he, he, when he offered up himself, Hebrews 7. Hebrews 8 verse 4, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. So you see how he's telling the Hebrews here, note that this tabernacle that Jesus is a priest of, the true tabernacle, is not an earthly tabernacle. Because remember, they were fixated on the works of the law, the tabernacle, Moses, the Old Testament. And he's trying to get them off that. And he's saying, hey, if Jesus Christ as a priest after the order of Melchizedek was an earthly priest, right? He, would, he can't be on earth, right? He wouldn't be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. See, there's already priests that offer sacrifices on earth, and he's not a priest after the order of Levi. So he's not on earth. Who serve unto the example of shadow and shadow of heavenly things. So the ones that serve on earth in the earthly tabernacle, he's saying the earthly tabernacle is just a shadow of the true tabernacle in heaven. Right? As Moses was admonished of God, when he, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So he's reminding them back to Exodus 25 that when was Moses was commanded to make the tabernacle, that wasn't the true tabernacle. That wasn't the true, that was just a picture of the real tabernacle in heaven. But people 
you know, the Hebrews were thinking, hey, oh, we could get perfect by that tabernacle. And this is why he's making this case. No, there's no perfection by the Levitical priesthood and comparing it to the priesthood of Jesus. So in verse 20, uh, 40 in Exodus 25, this is where Moses is commanded, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. So you remember, Moses was shown the true tabernacle in heaven. And that's when God told Moses, hey, make this earthly tabernacle as a shadow of what truly existed in heaven. Hebrews 8 verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. So you have the earthly tabernacle, the earthly priest, the covenant of works, whereas Jesus Christ is a priest of the uh, of, of an oath, an excellent ministry, more excellent ministry, one that it is in heaven based upon a better covenant, a covenant of grace rather than a covenant of works. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. What's, what's the better promises? Because the Old Testament promise was that if you kept the law, then you could be saved. Right? But then it's not possible to keep the law. The New Testament is if you have faith, if you believe on Jesus Christ, then you'll be saved. So they both are a promise, but one's a promise of grace, one's a promise of works. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now I think some people misunderstand, because I don't think that there was anything wrong with the first covenant in the sense that I don't think that's what it's teaching. It's not saying that there's a problem with the law. There's a problem with God's law. You know, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. But what it's saying here, the reason why the first covenant wasn't faultless is because the fault was with us. The fact that we could not keep that covenant and therefore we could not approach to God by that old covenant. See, so it says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So it's saying, if the first covenant was faultless, there would be no need for a second covenant. But because we are not perfect, that first covenant was replaced by a second covenant, wherein we are able to become perfect by the sacrifice of Jesus and by faith. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now this passage, and to basically the rest of the chapter, is actually a quote from Jeremiah, right? Talking about, you know, Jeremiah was the preacher that preached when Judah would go into captivity. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. So you see how he's referring to the old covenant, that God made a covenant with the people of Israel, but they didn't keep it. And this is why Jeremiah is preaching on this, because, you know, eventually they went into captivity. That's something that we learned about today in Kids Bible Club. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. So rather than writing them on the tables, right, on the two tablets, he's saying, hey, instead it's going to be written in their heart. And I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a, pe a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest so there will come a time where all of us will know God because of by, because of by grace right so we don't have to be taught to keep these commandments in order to know God we know him by grace through faith know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So this is a quote from Jeremiah 31 where Jeremiah is preaching about this new covenant to come. And I won't read through it all, but it's basically word for word. You know, as you read through it, Jeremiah is basically saying the same thing. So he's taking this quote from Jeremiah 31, verse 31 all the way down to verse 34. And iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So again, they couldn't get rid of their sins by the old covenant. And even Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 33, he's prophesying of this covenant that was to come where God would take away their sins completely. And that's where we finish on the last verse of Hebrews 8. It says, In that he saith a new covenant, 
So what is he referring to? He's referring to that prophecy in Jeremiah, right? That I will make a new covenant. He also quotes that in Hebrews 8, where he says, finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with them. And then he ends Hebrews 8, where he says, in that he saith a new covenant. So when God talks about a new covenant, he hath made the first old. So the old covenant was the first covenant, but the fact that a new covenant was coming, that's now why we refer to the old covenant as the old covenant or the old testament. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So remember chapter 7, difference between the two priesthoods. And he's saying, hey, there's going to be, a, just like there was a, there's the true tabernacle and then, then there's the tabernacle on earth. Hebrews 8 is him basically saying, hey, there's a new covenant coming. Jesus is the priest of the new covenant. He's the priest of the heavenly tabernacle, the true tabernacle that Moses just made a pattern of. And he's saying, now that there's a new covenant, that old pattern, that old covenant is, is ready to be replaced, to vanish away. That's the point he's making in Hebrews 8. Now we go on to Hebrews 9. And Hebrews 9 is quite an interesting chapter because you learn a lot about the tabernacle right if you didn't if you didn't catch it when you're reading through exodus you're reading through leviticus and what's happening he really gives a nice summary of what is happening in that old testament tab tabernacle because what is he doing now in hebrews 9 in hebrews 9 because remember hebrews 7 was the priesthoods hebrews 8 was it's being replaced hebrews 9 now is a comparison between the earthly tabernacle and what happened in the earthly tabernacle to the heavenly tabernacle and what, how the things that happened in the earthly tabernacle were a shadow of the things that happened in the real tabernacle, which is in heaven, the one that God made. So this is why he refers to the earthly tabernacle as the worldly sanctuary, right? So now he's talking about that. So not only is he comparing the activities in the earthly tabernacle to the, to the activity that it represented in the heavenly tabernacle, but also the blood dedication that happened in the Old Testament and that being also a shadow of Jesus Christ being that offering and, and using his own blood to purify the things in, the, in, the, in heaven and us being able to go in, you know, as, as priesthood of the believer, to be able to go into the holiest of all and then sprinkling the, the blood on the mercy seat. Hebrews 9. Then verily the first covenant also had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. <clears throat> so you remember the Levitical priesthood <coughs> the Levitical priesthood, they had things that they had to do. The animal sacrifices, that's what it's referring to. And it had a worldly, a physical on earth tab uh, sanctuary. So you remember the sanctuary was the first tabernacle. The holiest of all was the second tabernacle. right? And this is what he's going to describe here. For there was a tabernacle made... The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, what is a tabernacle? A tabernacle is just a tent. All right, so we see here in 2 Samuel 7. So this is, this is, 2 Samuel 7 is where David gets this idea that he, that he wants to build God a house. Because basically, you know, David is living in a, in, a, in a castle, right? In a house made of wood and cedar. So he says, you know, he's looking around at his house and he's saying, man, I dwell in such a nice house. But the ark of God dwells in tents and in curtains. So he's like, you know what? I want to make God a, a nice house like I have. And this is where God says to him, you know, I've, I've never commanded you to make me a house. And, and one of the reasons why I believe so is because uh, that God existed in a tent because it was transient, right? It was the fact that, you know, the temple of God, the true tabernacle, the temple existed in heaven, which was the, the picture that he allowed Solomon to build, that that became a picture of the temple in, the new, in, in heaven. But I think the reason why God made his tabernacle on earth and the covenant and all that in, in a tent, because it was transient, you know, like we're sojourners here in this world. We're not meant to sort of, you know, put down our house, if that makes sense, and, and, and be permanent dwellers here. So this is 2 Samuel 7. It came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David. So this is after David says to Nathan, hey, I want to build this house. Nathan says to him, go and do all that's in your heart. Then God comes to Nathan and says, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? So even though Nathan sort of gave David the blessings, God then comes to Nathan and says, you know, I, never, I never told David to do this for me. 
Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but look at this, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. So if you're wondering what a tabernacle is, it's just a tent. So the tabernacle of the Old Testament, it was basically just two tents and there was a veil to go into the first tabernacle, which was the sanctuary, and then there was a veil to go into the second tabernacle, which was the holiest of all. But only the high priest could go into the second tabernacle once every year. Uh, let's go on. So this, you know, this is where he wanted to build him a house of cedar. Let's go on verse 3, Hebrews 9. Uh, wait, sorry, let's just go back to verse 2. Because it says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first. Right? So there's a first tabernacle, and then there's a second tabernacle, and he explains what's in each one. Wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So if you remember, the candlestick, I believe, had seven knops. If, if you've read through Exodus and Leviticus, you'll remember that it's, there's described there's this candlestick and the knops and how it is. So if you now, now you know, if you didn't realize back then, that that candlestick was in the first tent right, with the seven candles. So that candlestick was there. There was a table there as well in that first tabernacle and the showbread. So there was always bread kept there as an offering. And if you remember when David, remember when David was hungry and he went to Abiathar the priest and he asked if there was any food and Abiathar gave them the sword of Goliath. And remember he ate the showbread? Well, this is the bread that he was eating. So there was the, the bread that was in the first tabernacle that was only made for the priest to eat. But then Abiathar gave them to eat of that bread. Um, and Jesus basically teaching the New Testament, saying, well, you know, why was David allowed to profane the tabernacle by eating the showbread? Well, because the showbread was there as a picture for the, for the, for the, for the Levites, for the priests. But it's not, it's not to say that if somebody's starving and about to die, you can't give them that bread for them to eat. So that's the point that Jesus is making there, that you know, mercy and love and justice and judgment outweigh you know, the keeping of these Levitical laws. So it's the same with the Sabbath, right? I like guess if an ox fell into a pit you know, on the Sabbath day, you're going to help them out. You're going to heal on the Sabbath because those proceed, love precedes you know, the, the commandments of the Levitical priesthood. So that's what's happening in this first tabernacle. Hebrews 9, chapter, uh, verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So you see how now there are these two tents. The first veil into the sanctuary, second veil into the holiest of all. Right? Which has, so what's in, now we learn, we're told here, well, we're reminded, right? Because we can obviously look back at the Old Testament and see this described in more depth. But that's why i find this is a really interesting passage because you know if you, if you don't get what's kind of going on in exodus and leviticus when paul describes it here in hebrews 9 you get a much clearer picture of this old testament tabernacle which had the golden censer what's the golden censer the golden censer was a big golden bowl and you imagine when they burn incense right when people have the bowls of incense all the ashes in there that's where they would burn their incense so the incense that they're burning that's, that's in, inside there. If you remember, that's how uh, Nadab and Abihu died, right? Because they burnt strange fire before the Lord and fire came out and devoured them, right? When they tried to go into the, um, the holiest of all. So that's the golden center. The Ark of the Covenant, what was that? That was the box, golden lay, you know, made of gopher wood and it was overlaid in gold and it had rings on the four side of the box. What were the rings for? It's because they put the golden bars, you know, those those poles through those rings so that they could carry the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was inside the holiest of all as well, the second tabernacle, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. So now we're told, if you didn't catch this in the Old Testament, what is actually kept inside that box, right, inside that Ark of the Covenant. There was the golden pot that had manna, so there was a pot inside the Ark of the Covenant that kept some of the manna that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness. So that was one thing that was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is now. I don't know if somebody's hiding it somewhere or you know, whether it's just lost. But that was in there. And Aaron's rod that budded. I don't know if I have that here. So I don't know if you know, if you knew this. Aaron's rod that budded, if you know that story. And the tables of the covenant. So what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? A pot of manna. Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, the two stones that Moses got the Ten Commandments on, those were in the Ark of the Covenant as well. Now, what is Aaron's rod that budded? I'll just go here to Exodus 25. Uh, is this where it was? 
Oh, maybe I didn't actually put that story in. <laughs> I thought I did. I think it's in number 17. Basically, uh, I'll just go over it quickly. But if you didn't know, if you didn't know the story of... Um, this is... Oh, that's the offering to make, to make the tabernacle. Here we go. Aaron's rod that budded. Now, if you, if you didn't know the story of Aaron's rod that budded, basically the story there was why this, why this rod was important. Because Aaron, Aaron was ordained of God to be the high priest. Right? So Moses was the, you know, of the Levite tribe as well. He kind of interceded on behalf of the people of Israel. But then Aaron was ordained as the first priest, and that's why it's known as the Aaronic priesthood. So the Levite tribe was chosen to, to do the service of the tabernacle. So you have Merari, Kohath, and Gershon, I think it is, on top of my head. Those, those were the three sons of Levi that had the different uh, jobs in the Old Testament tabernacle. So because they, that their job, that tribe's job, was to serve the tabernacle, they weren't given an inheritance. That's why they were told to take tithes of the people. So the, the other 12 tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim being the, the tribe of Joseph that was divided into two because he got the double portion of inheritance, um, being, being the one that was blessed. So you had the 12 tribes, including Manasseh and Ephraim. Levi was kept out because they did the service of God and the rest of the 12 tribes paid tithes to the Levitical priesthood. So they didn't have to till the land and everything. They did the service of the tabernacle and they were cared for. And it says that the tithes that they collected of the people, that was as if they did the land and, and looked after sheep and all that sort of stuff. Now what happened in the Old Testament in Numbers 17 is some people would, got envious of that. And basically the other Levites and some of the other people murmured against Aaron and against Moses and basically didn't like the fact that they were chosen to be the priests. And there was, a, there was a big conflict between them and God sent a whole bunch of people to hell. But basically that's what, that's what the story was about. It was a bunch of people rebelling against the God-ordained order and the priesthood. They didn't like that Aaron was made the priest. And they're saying, hey, you take too much upon yourselves. Hey, all of us could be priests. Why do you guys get to do it? And then God got angry with those people that rebelled and basically opened up the earth and people literally physically went down to hell. So after that happened, God wanted to have a testimony to say that Aaron was the one that was ordained to be the priest. So what they did was they got every one of the heads of all the tribes, all the 12 tribes, including the tribe of Levi, which was Aaron, and they all wrote their names on their rod. Right? And then Moses said, hey, we're going to take everyone's rod, we're going to put it into the tabernacle, and then tomorrow we're going to look at them, and whichever one buds, it's going to prove that that was the tribe chosen in order to do the service of the tabernacle. So which one was the one that budded? It was Aaron's rod. So he took Aaron's rod out, and it budded and flourished to the point like almonds were growing on it and stuff like that. So that rod was kept in the Ark of the Covenant as a testimony that that priesthood was given to Aaron. That's what that story was about. So go and read that back yourself. If you go back, I believe it's number 17 off the top of my head, number 16, 17, because I was just looking at it last night. So go and read that story. That's the story of Korah. You know Korah and the gainsaying of Korah in the New Testament? That's what that was all about. So now we keep going, verse 5, describing the Ark of the Covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. So you remember the Ark and the Covenant, how it was built as a box? Now we know what's inside it. Over the top was the mercy seat, and you had the cherubims with their wings covering the mercy seat. So some people draw it like this. Some people draw it like this, how the cherubims are on top. But you have two cherubims, and that, and that is actually a picture of the real cherubims that are on either side of God in, in heaven, right? Because there are cherubims and seraphims in the temple of God in heaven. So that's why it's a picture of that. So that's that, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, what does he mean by that? I, I think it, what he's talking about there when he talks about we cannot now speak particularly about the tabernacle because by Paul's time, the tabernacle no longer existed. Remember the tabernacle was replaced by the temple by Solomon because I think David misunderstood the commandment of God to, to build him a house, that, that his son would build the house. So he got Solomon to build the house. That replaced 
the tabernacle. So once the temple was built, there was no longer a tabernacle. So when he's explaining these things, he's saying, hey, this is how it worked in the Old Testament. This is how the tabernacle worked. But now we can't speak of it particularly in the sense that, that this tabernacle no longer exists. It's no longer there. The Ark of the Covenant was in the temple. I don't know where that Ark is anymore. Uh, but it was now when the temple was built, they put the Ark of the Covenant into that temple. That was when David, you know, dancing and the music and everything, and they're bringing the covenant back and putting it into the house of God, into the temple. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So now he's talking about how this earthly tabernacle works. So the priest would go into that first tent, and that's where, you know, where the sacrifices would get made and all this sort of stuff, things that they would do. Accomplishing the service of God. Uh, I wanted to go here. This is, this is basically where Moses was told to build the tabernacle, right? So, so all the things, if, if you're wondering where all these things happen in the Old Testament, you can go and read in Exodus 25 where Moses is, tells the people, hey, in 25 is where it starts, where he gathers an offering up from all the different people and they come and give him all different sorts of material and jewels and gold and spices and then from there, that's when he starts to make things. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And then it goes on to describe the Ark of the Covenant. And they shall make an Ark of shittim wood, two cubits. Sorry, so it's shittim wood, not gopher wood. Gopher wood was the Ark of Noah. <laughs> shittim wood is the, the, the Ark of um, the Covenant. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So if you then read from Exodus 25, you'll get all the in-depth details of the Ark of the Covenant and all the censer and the candlesticks and everything that he's describing in Hebrews 9. Uh, okay, let's go on to verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, for he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So you see, the first tabernacle is where they did the service of God. It had the table and the showbread and the candlesticks. But once every year, the high priest would offer a sacrifice for himself, offer a sacrifice for the people. And once every year, that high priest went into the Holy Spirit, into the second tabernacle. And I'm pretty sure, on the, I'm pretty sure they tied a rope to that priest, that high priest that went into the tabernacle. And he had a bell so they could hear him moving. And if that bell, they stopped hearing it, it was that because the high priest died in there if he didn't do it the right way. And then they'd have to pull him out, right, and do it again. So it was a very serious task, you know, and a very fearful task, right? That's why it's, it's differentiating between being fearful going into the holiest of all as opposed to us being able to boldly go. So you see there's the difference of us being boldly going into, the, into God's rest, into the presence of God, as opposed to the Old Testament tabernacle where it was all very fearful, right? Because there was all these things that need to be done and it was only a shadow of the true. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, all this stuff in the Old Testament, these two tabernacles, and the fact that you know the high priest could only go in once a year and all this, all this he's saying, this is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost setting up this earthly tabernacle through Moses was a witness to us that the true way of getting into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. What was that? The fact that the Christ would be manifest in the flesh, he would die and rise again, and then through him we're able to enter into the holiest of all. So he's saying up until Jesus Christ came, and you know, remember when Jesus Christ died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain and he was established the new covenant? He's saying, while this old covenant still stood and this old tabernacle, this earthly tabernacle still stood, this was the Holy Ghost witnessing or testifying or signifying to us that the way into the real holiest of all was not yet made manifest, right? That Jesus Christ would come. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing and this was a figure for the time then present in which were offered these things and he says hey which stood in meats and drinks and diverse washings this was the service that they had to do in that first tabernacle saying hey 
the, the way into the real holiest of all was not yet made manifest. And carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. What is that? Until the time to reform something, until the time of change, right? Until the priesthood is changed, the laws are changed. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. When is that? But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So you see how that old tabernacle was just a picture of the true tabernacle. And just like in the Old Testament tabernacle, the priest had to go in with blood, this is now he's referring to Jesus Christ, the fact that he shed his own blood and entered into the true holiest of all with his own blood. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, what is a heifer? A heifer is a type of cow. So that's another name for a cow. Sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. So it's just like in the Old Testament where they would have to shed blood and sprinkle themselves to sanctify themselves, to enter into the holiest of all. He's saying here, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and, uh, to serve the living God. So right, so they were sprinkled and sanctified to serve God. And just like now, we are sprinkled and sanctified in order that we might enter into the holiest of all and serve God. But notice here that it's purging our conscience from dead works. That's what the blood of sprinkling does. Just like back in the Old Testament, or well, back in the Old Testament saying, hey, the blood of bulls and goats could not make anyone perfect, their conscience, according to the conscience, right? Whereas Jesus Christ was able to purge the conscience from dead works so that we are able then to enter into the holiest of all. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. So we know from Jesus that many are called, but few are chosen. And that's why it's saying here, they're called in order to enter into that rest, into the holiest of all. But only those who believe actually enter into rest and receive that promise of inher eternal inheritance. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That's Jesus. So the fact that he died, that's what makes him the mediator of the New Testament. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So for, in order for the New Testament to be established, somebody has to die. So Jesus Christ died in order to establish his New Testament. Why? For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So it's kind of like a will. See, when you write a will, that will doesn't come into effect until you die. Because while you're alive, you can still change that will and alter that will. But the will comes into effect when the person dies. And that's the same thing that's happening here with the New Testament. The New Testament comes into force when Jesus dies and rises again. That's why it's very important that when you read through the Gospels, you are reading through a time when the Old Testament is still in effect. That's why Jesus talks about the Sabbath. That's why he talks about tithing. He talks about keeping the laws. You know, he is expounding on keeping the laws and saying, hey, you need to keep these laws in order to be saved. He's saying that because that's the Old Testament covenant, right? But he's also teaching that to show people that nobody can be made perfect by that, right? And that's why he healed people and did all these things because that was the proof of the New Testament that people were getting healed by faith, being a picture of being healed spiritually by grace through faith. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is, no, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So he's saying just like the first testament was dedicated with blood, right? Because it's a double negative there. Neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, so it was dedicated with blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the, of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things 
are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. So you need blood in order to purge things in order for them to come to God. And just like in the Old Testament in Exodus 24, we see here Moses, right? He sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. He took that blood. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. So this is the Old Testament picture of the New Testament where Moses is sanctifying the things in order to be used of God. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. So you see here the picture the Old Testament is painting. They were sanctified in order to be saved, I guess, by the Old Testament. But the Old Covenant, the profession that they made was that they will be obedient to God. But we know that they didn't end up being obedient to God, right? They didn't keep, they didn't hold fast the profession that they had made in the Old Covenant. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So that's what's being talked about in Hebrews 9, where he says, hey, Moses in the Old Testament dedicated things with blood. Now he goes on to the true tabernacle, the true things that are being dedicated by Jesus' blood. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. So just like the pattern of things on earth were purified with blood, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Well, who is that better sacrifice? Jesus Christ. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So just like the Old Testament high priest entered into the holiest of all with blood, Jesus took his own blood and went into heaven and, took, and went into the holiest of all, the true tabernacle in heaven, to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood. So you see how in the Old Testament, every year the high priest would go in once with blood. But he's saying, hey, Jesus Christ is not like that. He only had to do it once. If he had to do it every year, then... For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. So he's saying if Jesus had to go in once every year into the true tabernacle, then he would have to die again and again every year. right? But no, he died once for all. Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice by himself. And now this is the famous passage in Hebrews 9.27. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So he's coming back in his glorified body as we look for that return of Jesus Christ. All right, so that's a summary that's, uh, as we go through Hebrews 7 and 9. So just to recap, remember Hebrews 7 was the comparison of the priesthood of Melchizedek to the, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. Chapter 8 in Hebrews is basically saying, hey, God prophesied of a new covenant. The new covenant is going to replace the old covenant. And then in Hebrews 9, you learn a lot about the worldly sanctuary, the worldly tabernacle, because it's being compared to the real tabernacle in heaven and the fact that you know, Jesus was not a priest entering into the physical tabernacle. He actually went into the true tabernacle in heaven and entered into the holiest of all and will make intercession for us as our high priest. All right, next week we're going to go into Hebrews 10. So if you've taken in what we've learned so far from Hebrews 1 to Hebrews 9, when I go through Hebrews 10, that will make a, a lot more sense to you, just laying the groundwork for that. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the better promises of the New Testament. Thank you that we have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not a high priest after the order of Aaron that could not make us perfect, but we have an, a priest after the order of Melchizedek established on the better promises, the covenant of grace. So thank you, Lord, that through grace, by faith, uh, we can enter into the holiest of all. Jesus Christ being our forerunner, you know, his sacrifice being enough for us and his blood testifying and interceding on our behalf. So thank you, Lord, for that. 
And we just pray that everyone would truly hold fast to that profession, that everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ truly in their heart does believe and enters into that rest. So thank you, Lord, for teaching us these things, helping us to understand the difference between the old covenant and the new and why things have been done away because they're a shadow of things to come and why there are many laws that we no longer keep um, in, in the Levitical laws and the Mosaic laws. So Lord, give us wisdom as we continue to study this book out. Help us to understand and we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.